Now time for further debates. I recognize the member for Guelph. Thank you, Speaker, it's always an honour to rise today to uh, debate Bill 180, the government's budget bill. And it's interesting that we're debating this bill on the same day the Financial Accountability Officer released their economic and budget outlook uh, for Ontario. And when you compare, when the FAO compared the 2016-2017 to 22-23 uh, period versus the current and projected periods for 2022-23 to 28-29, they only found one area of spending where we're seeing a significant increase in government spending. You know what that area was, Speaker? Interest on debt. Health care going down, education going down, uh, community social services slight, slight increase. Uh, the one area we saw a significant increase, interest on debt, which to me just shows a government, I mean, we haven't had a government in Ontario's history that has spent so much, increased the debt by so much, and actually gotten so little out of it. If we weren't, if we weren't experiencing the various crises in the province of Ontario, you might understand the under the the decrease in the in, in, increase in expending in all the other major categories. But Speaker, I want to talk about five areas of the budget where the government falls short. And I'm going to start with housing. Right now in Ontario tonight, on average, any night in this province, 16,000 people will be unhoused in Ontario. The average market rent in the province of Ontario for a one-bedroom apartment is now $2,200. It takes the average young person 22 years to save for a down payment on a new home. We have a whole generation of young people wondering if they'll ever own a home. And the government had an opportunity in the budget to actually legalize housing, legalize four plexes, four-story as of right. They had a chance to legalize six to 11 story buildings along major transit and transit corridors. Something builders tell me will cut their building times in half. Just those two measures, key recommendations from the government's own task force. They had an opportunity to legalize commercial to residential transitions. They had an opportunity to legalize um, making it easy to build on underutilized strip malls and parking lots so we can quickly increase housing supply in places where we already have infrastructure built. But unfortunately, the government said, not in my backyard, not going to legalize housing at a time when we're in a housing crisis. The government also had an opportunity to invest more in nonprofit co-op and permanent supportive housing. As a matter of fact, the Bank of Nova Scotia says that we need 250,000 additional nonprofit and co-op deeply affordable homes built over the next decade. Do you know how many the government has built since they've taken office? Around 1,100. Only 6% of the commitment they made to the federal government in 2018. And the reason this is so important, and I've seen this in my own community, and I'm going to compliment the government on this one. We actually have succeeded in building permanent supportive housing in Guelph. We got to yes. And I want to take a moment, because this was highlighted in the budget, to thank the Associate Minister of Housing and Minister of Health for saying yes to building and funding permanent supportive housing in Guelph. And I was happy to see it highlighted in the budget. But why aren't we seeing that across communities all across Ontario, where so many people are desperate for housing? Speaker, I want to turn a moment to health care. And I wanted to address health care because right now, 2.3 million Ontarians do not have access to a family doctor. Hallway medicine is the norm in Ontario, even though this government said they were going to eliminate it when they first ran for election. And we have emergency departments closing across the province of Ontario. And I know I've been listening to the members in debate, and they're saying, hey, we're going to build more hospitals and long-term care homes. What I haven't heard them talking about is who's actually going to staff any of these hospitals, long-term care homes, uh, primary care offices, especially at a time when the projection is that over the next decade we're going to be short 
33,200 nurses and 50,853 permanent uh, personal support workers. There wasn't anything in the budget about addressing these staffing shortages that will be critical to making sure that health care services are available to the people of Ontario when and where they need it. So I want to shift to education now. You know what the biggest cut in the budget was? Post-secondary education. Critical to our economic well-being, to educating the workers of the future. And you know what's so surprising about seeing that cut in the budget was prior to the budget, the government said, hey, we're going to invest $1.3 billion in post-secondary education, which was less than half of what their own Blue Ribbon panel said. But the government failed to address the fact that we're going to have less international students coming, which is going to cost our post-secondary education sector $1.8 billion, which actually led to a real cut in the government's budget on post-secondary education. On top of that, we're dealing with a teacher shortage in our elementary and secondary education. As a matter of fact, um, just yesterday, the Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario released a report on the alarming increase in violence in our schools due to the shortage of adults in the schools teaching our children. As a matter of fact, a third of secondary schools in Ontario face daily teacher shortages, not addressed in the budget. The next area I want to talk about in the budget is poverty. Poverty. 16, um, or sorry, 16,000 people unhoused on any given night in Ontario, and 717,000 people, 717, 717, people uh, living in legislative poverty in the province of Ontario, many of those people with disabilities. It's shameful in a province that is as wealthy as Ontario, especially when we know that poverty costs this province $33 billion a year. The government had an opportunity to increase ODSP and OW rates to a level that brought, would bring people above the poverty line. That was not addressed in the budget, Speaker. I want to close by talking about the climate crisis. Because the government had an opportunity in this budget to bring forward a climate affordability plan to help us reduce climate pollution and make life more affordable for the people of Ontario. One way they could have done that was to make heat pumps affordable for people. We know that heat pumps save people 13% on their heating and cooling bills versus folks with gas furnaces, though today, unfortunately, the government passed a bill imposing those expensive gas furnaces on to new home buyers. PEI offers free heat pumps for people with over, with, that make under $100,000 a year to help them be able to afford increases in energy costs in their homes. The government could have also had money in this budget to expand EV charging stations across the province and to bring back EV rebates so people can, in this province can actually afford to drive the electric vehicles we want to build in Ontario. And I will say, yes, we're making some progress on building electric vehicles in this province, and we should all celebrate that. But you know what? It'd be nice if Ontarians could actually afford to drive those electric vehicles. And it would also be, it would also be nice if we would open up investment opportunities in renewable energy, low-cost wind and solar, because of the $1.88 trillion invested in the green energy transition, half of it to wind and solar. It's now time for questions. I recognize the member for Oakville. Thank you, Speaker. Um, it sounds to me that uh, what you're talking about is you'd like to see a lot more spending, because everything you rhymed off, you talked about spending, and yet you talked about having a large deficit. So I, can't, I don't know where you're coming from, but I do want to ask the member what his thoughts are of the Auditor General having six clean audits of this government, which is a first in the province. Secondly, 
the S&P rating service upgrading the Ontario debt. And third, today, by the way, for the people in the chamber, it was a news release from Moody's, which said, quote, this positive outlook for Ontario reflects the forecast that Ontario is likely to post better than budgeted results and continue to proceed on a steady path to improvement in its debt, redurden, debt burden and reduction in deficits. So my question to the member is, what are your thoughts on what these third party people say about how we're running our budgets here in Ontario? Back to the member for Guelph. Well, I'll just say, regardless of what the third party said, the financial accountability officer, independent officer of this legislature, showed that the biggest percentage area of growth in spending over the next few years versus the last few years is interest on debt. The member talked about some of the things I would prioritize spending on. I want to tell the member the things that I think they're misprioritizing spending on, because we could meet the objectives I've talked about within our existing fiscal framework. Do you know that we're the only jurisdiction in all of North America that spends over $7 billion subsidizing electricity prices in the province of Ontario? And people who earn over $100,000 are getting that subsidy. So why not means test it for low and middle income households, not wealthy households, so we can actually invest in health care, education, and housing affordability? Question. I recognize the member for Nickel Belt. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, the uh, housing crisis is throughout the province. That includes in my riding of Nickel Belt. As you know, Speaker, there's a brand new gold mine, I am Gold, that has op that has opened. They've started to uh, get some gold out of it. I'm going to the grand opening on Wednesday. But uh, two years ago, we had the ribbon cutting for the uh, starting of the mine, and uh, the premier was there. Uh, at the time, I told them that uh, the government owned homes, beautiful homes in Gogama. They closed down the OPP office, where the OPP officer used to live, where beautiful homes, uh, uh, where the MNR office, that they closed, beautiful homes. Those homes should be put up for sale. I've asked the ministry uh, to put them up for sale for the last two years, and they have not. Does he think that it would be a good idea for those home rather than to stay Back to the member empty? from Guelph for a response. Yeah, I appreciate the member's question. And I'll just say, when you're in a housing crisis, leaving homes empty makes absolutely no sense, no matter where they're located. So I would say, yes, make those homes available and make them available to people in a way that's affordable. And I want to talk about affordable housing for a second, because 93 percent of the deeply affordable homes in the province of Ontario were built before 1995. What happened in 1995? The provincial and federal governments got out of supporting deeply affordable housing. It's time for them to get back in, like the Scotia Bank report says, so we can actually make our communities and our homes affordable for people. For one quick question, I recognize the member, the Associate Minister of Housing. Well, thank you, Speaker. Um, always good to hear my friend opposites thoughts and opinions and that while we may not always agree um, I know we all share the need to build more homes in this province and one of the things I want to get his opinion on <clears throat> excuse me is that with the Minister of Inf Infrastructure just in front of me we have over three billion dollars that we're investing in infrastructure that is the number one constraint to get homes built today frankly housing enabling water fund the new billion dollars in the budget to help more infrastructure for small Question. rural municipalities and obviously the Building Faster Fund. Question. So do you not see those being supportive to get houses Back to built? the member from Guelph. Yeah, I, think, I appreciate the member's question. We absolutely need funding for infrastructure for housing. There's no doubt about it. I mean, it's unfortunate that with Bill 23, a couple years ago, the government made changes that took infrastructure funding away from municipalities. That's finally coming back, but it's too bad we lost two years of opportunities to construct homes. So yes, we're making progress in the right direction. It's unfortunate we wasted time, but why don't we say yes to building homes in my backyard where we already have infrastructure built so we can quickly... It's now time for further debate.